And so today we're starting a brand new series entitled Mission Supernatural. Amen. Come on, give God praise. Mission Supernatural. As we begin to set our, our sights on the revivals in March in the supernatural, we want to begin to prepare our hearts and our faith to step out into the, the supernatural and to step out into the mission that God has called us to. Yeah. Amen. If you have your Bibles, we will be reading this morning in Mark chapter 8. While you're standing, we're going to read the Word of God. Mark chapter 8, verses 31 through 35. Uh, Pastor Johnny again gave the update from our bishop. They, uh, I got a phone call yesterday. They're praying for us, but again, continue to pray for them even as they return for safe travels. Amen? Amen. 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 What a blessing to have a bishop who who said, no, we, we have to do this. We have to do this. We're not doing what we're doing because somebody's forcing the issue. This is initiated from our bishop, amen? amen. Mark chapter 8, verse 31. Here, here's to another uncomfortable conversation. Get ready, amen, as we read God's word. You have it? Yeah. Amen. And he began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders and the chief priests and the scribes, and be killed, and after three days rise again. He spoke this word openly. Then Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. He's rebuking Jesus. Do y'all see that? But when he had turned around, this is Jesus, and looked at his disciples. He looks at Peter. He looks at the disciples. He rebuked Peter, saying, Get behind me, Satan, for you are not mindful of the things of God, but of the things of men. Verse 34. When he had called the people to himself, very important, with his disciples also, he said to them, Whoever desires to come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. For whoever desires to save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake and the gospel's will save it. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for all the good things that you're doing in our lives. You've brought us here to a new day, and for that we're grateful. Father, we thank you that we're able to gather in a church like this to hear your word and to participate in the work that you have for us to do. And Father, we ask this morning that you would anoint our hearts to hear your word. Open our minds to receive it. Give us a will to obey it. And Father, I ask that you would anoint me to proclaim your word as the very oracles of God so that lives would be impacted forever. We give you praise this morning. We give you thanks in Jesus' name. Come on, if you love the Lord, why don't you give him a loud amen? amen. Come on, if you love him, give him a loud amen. amen. You may have your seat. You may have your seat. Amen. It's the 34th verse of the 8th chapter of Mark that I want to draw our attention to. And this passage is found in each of the synoptic gospels, which are Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And, and that should give us the importance of what is happening in this passage. Verse 34, Jesus says, New King James, if anyone desires to come after me, desires to come after me. Let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. As I was reading this passage, I noticed that that was a very uncomfortable conversation and a very uncomfortable call that he gave his disciples. My title this morning is called Out of Comfort. I want you to write that down. 
that Jesus calls us out of our place of comfort to follow him. As disciples of Jesus, we're called to join in his mission in life and as a church, and it isn't comfortable. This passage evokes these thoughts as posed by Bishop Mark Sharona. Where is Jesus? What is he up to? Where is he going? And I want you to hear me. Are we going with him? It's amazing how in the service, through the worship and the announcement, how what each person who is leading begins to share certain anecdotes and certain thoughts that we don't always know what the Holy Spirit is saying to us. I've become aware of a pattern in life and in Scripture. I want you to write this down. Four words, comfort, fear, death, life. Comfort precedes fear. Fear precedes death. Death precedes life. If we're to move into the life that God has promised and desires for us, we're going to have to move out of our comfort zone, have courage to face our fears, pick up our cross, which involves dying to self, and enter by faith into the life of God's intention. There are two types of comfort. I want you to write this down. There's a comfort that comes from this world. Its aim causes a spiritual sleep. It makes you okay with sin. Its goal is for you to give up in difficult times, to stop believing. It says, I want this just to get easier. I want life to get easier. There's a comfort that comes from this world. How many have ever been tempted with just giving up? But there's a comfort that comes from God by the Holy Spirit. It reminds us of our true promises. It, he, he leads us into all truth. He meets us in our grief. But it requires an enduring faith. The comfort of the Holy Spirit is God's promise to you so that you can live a life that has a spiritual vitality, so that you can live full of the Spirit, to live a life that's impactful in overcoming the difficulties and challenges of life. God wants you to be an overcomer. Come on, if you believe that, say amen. amen. And so he calls us out of this world's comfort, the bed of ease, to, to the life of faith that sees the promises of God fulfilled. Come on, you got to get this in your life. I, I'm, I'm mindful of the children of Israel when they came out of Egypt. And they were passing through the promised land, going into, passing through the wilderness into the promised land. And they said this in the wilderness, we had it easier in Egypt. You were bound in Egypt. You were, your family was there in Egypt, slaves for 400 years in Egypt. And you said it was better? Hey, hey, how many of us, it was easier when I wasn't saved. I got to wake up and go to church on Sunday. I, I can't sin like I want to. The pastor's always calling me, asking me how I'm doing. Let me be. Why don't you write this down? The life of faith is uncomfortable. As a parent, your job is to make your kids uncomfortable. <laughs> I remember when I was a kid, man, I hated waking up and going to school. And you know that time in between waking up and getting dressed you know, back in the day, I don't know if they do this now, but we had to wear our P.E. clothes underneath our uniform. Yeah. And then my mom used to make me wake up and make my bed. 
I'm telling y'all, I'm confessing, okay? It's all right. Can I confess this morning? I used to, as a kid, listen, look, look, we all have a laziness. Parents' job is to break laziness off of their kids. And, and I used to sleep on top of the comforter in my bedroom, in my PE clothes, so that I could put on my uniform and not have to make my bed. Somebody say lazy. You know, Abraham was called to an uncomfortable faith. When God calls Abraham to leave his father's house and to go to a place that he would show him, that's an uncomfortable command. Abraham was called out of what I call the stuck place, Genesis chapter 11. I want you to have that for your notes. That he, he was following his dad to Canaan. Look at where he was going in his life. I want you to see that big picture. He's on his way to Canaan. And, and before he got to Canaan with his dad, if you know the story, he stops off in Haran. Haran was the place where his brother lived. But here's what happened. His brother died. His dad died. He experienced grief, loss. And because of the grief, here's what he did. He stopped moving forward. He stayed there until God spoke to him. He stayed there and listen to where Abraham was. He was 75 years old. He had a wife who was barren all of those years. Nothing was happening for him. It seemed like his life had come to an end, but then God spoke and said, Abraham, get out of your father's house and go to a place that I will show you. He called him out of his comfort. He called him out of his stuck place. He calls us out of our comfort. What do we learn from Abraham's life of faith really quickly? It's never too late in this life to believe God. He lived in the land of promise as a stranger, even though he didn't possess it. There's something about living prophetically, knowing that God has given you something more. He had to fight for his family's freedom. He inherited Lot, his brother's son, and wound up having to fight for his deliverance. He gave the tithe in faith. God blessed him materially, though he waited 25 years for a promise of a son. He trusted and obeyed God, and the Bible tells us that God considered his faith as righteousness, and he was called the friend of God. But Abraham messed up. He wasn't perfect. He lived in covenant relationship with God. He saw promises fulfilled. He paid the full price for Sarah's burial and acquired the title deed. There's something about faith when you learn to wait and you acquire the possession in the spirit that you know that God will come through. Amen. That is title deed. Abraham, Hebrews tells us, waited for a heavenly country. This is Abraham's life of faith. This is the life of faith that God calls us to. And how many of you know that in the life of faith, miracles meet you in the tension? But it's uncomfortable. The mother eagle, in order to get the babies to fly, has to make the nest uncomfortable so that they begin to move toward their destiny their potential, what God created them for. Come on, somebody, say amen. amen. I want you to write this down. Remember, remember your call to discipleship. When we're looking at Mark chapter 8, this uncomfortable conversation, Jesus is talking to Peter. Now, Peter had just gotten it right. Previously in this passage, Jesus asks his disciples, who do men say that I am? Peter speaks up and says, you're the Christ, the son of the living God. And he gets this accolade from Jesus and he says, blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah. Flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my father in heaven. The next passage, Peter's getting rebuked. He goes from, you got it right, you're going to build my church, get behind me, Satan. 
and if we ever thought that we can't get it wrong. Peter takes Jesus aside to a private conversation. Lord, you can't be talking like that. You can't talk all openly about suffering and, and dying. And, and you, you can't do that. We, we're working here. We're building something here. And Peter gets rebuked. Now, is it private or public? The Bible says a public rebuke is good. I, I believe that this was such an uncomfortable conversation. It was like Peter called them to the side tries to rebuke him quietly, and he gets called out in front of everybody. <laughs> I mean, the, 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 the atmosphere was probably so tense that you could cut it with a knife. And Jesus, he, here's his rebuke. He begins to remind those who follow Jesus of their calling to discipleship. Not your calling to go to church. Not your calling to be a good person. Your calling to be a disciple of the risen Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Remember your call. Remember the objective of your call. It said, and he called them to himself. He called them and he said, if you want to follow me, let's talk about the objective of discipleship. It's something that we've not talked about enough in this popular Christianity with cute object lessons and social media. And I can pick up my favorite preacher online. If I don't like this one, I can go find someone. But how many of you know a YouTube preacher can't disciple you? What's the objective? I, 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 I feel that if you understand Jesus' objective, why? Because Peter's trying to get in the way of the objective. He's trying to stop the objective. The objective is eternal salvation. There's a safety in following Christ. It's an eternal security through faith in him. It's not safety the way we think safety. It's an inner safety that says it is well with my soul and eternal security, that no matter what comes in this life, I know that I have a place with him in heaven. The objective is relationship with Christ and becoming like him. This journey of discipleship, Peter calls it a pilgrimage has sanctification as a part of its objective, but it's overcoming your fears. I want you to hear me. Your sinful attitudes and behaviors, the sins of the body, the sins of the mind, the heart, and your distractions, which are idols. Becoming like Christ not only involves our belief and our thinking and our need for healing and freedom, but it involves our stewardship. Let's talk about stewardship. I want you to write this down. Faithfulness is uncomfortable. Faithfulness is uncomfortable. The goal of discipleship is stewardship, not status. Stewardship involves you being able to do the works of Jesus, not just take care of your money. Hello. Let's get into it. It was an economic term attributed to servants who proved faithful to be managers or rulers of the master's household and affairs. All that the father has is mine, John 16, 15, is a statement of stewardship and inheritance. The kingdom is a matter of inheritance that's released to those who through faith and faithfulness or patience acquire their kingdom rights and privileges. Your stewardship is about you being able to do what Jesus said, greater works shall you do because I go to the Father. 
What are those riches and those inheritances that are part of your supernatural inheritance now? We're talking about a mission. We're not just talking about our, our discipleship and acting good. But what does it mean to be a Christian in this world? That's on a supernatural mission. Hear me. The Holy Spirit is the administrator of the kingdom. He's the one who distributes everything that the Father has. Freely he gives. Severally. He distributes fruits and gifts by the Spirit. Here's a, here's a treasure of the kingdom, revelation, that, that you have to learn to steward the Word of God. What God is speaking to you in secret is maybe for now in secret, but there's a time where it becomes for public communication. So much of what I preach has been private stewardship of writing down what God is saying in my faithful time with Him. The land, the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. It's an inheritance for the believer. The meek shall inherit the earth. Signs, wonders, miracles, supernatural power is an inheritance. Favor is an inheritance. Supernatural treasure. I heard a testimony, two testimonies. Someone took off four months of work returned to work, and the job said, we didn't realize how much we need you. We're going to give you a promotion. You take off four months of work and see what they do. Favor. Someone else transitioned into a new job. Before they started the job, they agreed on a salary. HR called them and said, each year we upgrade salaries for living expenses, and we need to upgrade your salary based on living expenses, and, and so we need you to start, another, start next week so we could do that and give you more money. <laughs> You'll get that tomorrow. It's favor. Favor is when stuff happens, it don't make sense. Favor, when favor's on your life, you get opportunities, and it's like people saying, I don't know how this happened, and then they have to say, only could be God. Yes, that's it. Yes. Come on, we've been saying that you're getting ready to walk in supernatural favor, but you've got to believe it by faith. Yes. You've got to recognize that when God begins to communicate to you what the vision is and what he's saying from heaven, it's your faith that latches on to the word yes. and causes it to show up in your life. Five people who believe me, they're going to walk in it. You got to believe the word. I'm telling other people's testimony, but I can tell you my own, but I don't have time for that. I'm telling you, when it starts showing up in your life, you start looking at it and saying, God, I don't know how you did it. I don't care how you did it, but I'm glad that you did. Come on, you got to get excited this morning to know that you're about to walk into a season where the mission is called supernatural, and I'm walking in inheritances by the Spirit of God. I'm walking in revelation. I'm walking in power. I'm walking in favor. In Jesus' name. It's happening. It's happening. Listen, I just want to be in it. I just want to be in it. I just want mine. Listen, I'm not being selfish, but I'm being selfish because if God's going to move, I'm going to be a person that says, Lord, I've been faithful. The goal is your stewardship. Stewardship is bigger than money. Jesus, Luke 16, said, if you can't be faithful and unrighteous, ma'am, and in money, who can give you true riches? I'm talking about true riches, that if you've been faithful with your time, it's, that's not the end goal. It's the beginning. How you steward your money and your life is the beginning. It's not the end. When you stand at the end, he'll say, well done, my good and servant. Come on, God is good.
God is good. I want you to ask, this, ask yourself this question, write this down. Can you keep first things first and manage all these other things that he adds to you? That's the challenge of life. That's the challenge of life. Can you keep first things first and manage all these other things? Peter, in this awkward moment, he forgets the objective. The objective is the cross and the cross-shaped life. And if we're not careful to manage the tension between the cross, we too can be like Peter, standing in opposition of the cross and the cross-shaped life. I don't want to stand in opposition to the cross. I want to manage the tension of my desires. I want you to write this down, the tension of desire. There's a tension within your desires. There's a tension in this scripture. It's Peter's self-will that's getting in the way of the cross. And so Jesus says to Peter and all that follow him, Peter doesn't know why he's doing what he's doing. So many of us don't know why we do what we do in our behavior, but it's because we have a war within us of desire. I want you to hear me. I'm speaking by the Spirit. There's a war within you, Paul said, my spirit and my flesh that are constantly wrestling. So the things I want to do, I don't do. And the things I don't want to do is what I do. And I've got to get victory over my flesh. But it only comes at the cross. Your battle with sin is only healed at the cross. Your struggle with addiction is only healed at the cross. Your homosexuality, your inner desire that you can't control is only healed at the cross. He said, if you want to follow me, you got to learn how to deal with yourself. Get yourself out of the way. So many authors have spoken on the idea of the self and how there's a duality within each of us. There's something in us that desires wrong. But there's a renewed part of us in Christ that desires God. The battle of desire, the tension of desire, is between love for God and love for this world. Do I love him? Peter, do you love me? Yes, Lord, I love you. Feed my sheep. Peter, do you love me? Lord, you're asking me this. I love you. Do you love me, Peter? Take care of my lambs. Peter weeps when Jesus asks him the third time, does he love him? But it takes a lifetime to conquer your desire. And temptation doesn't stop just because you said yes to Jesus. And the life of faith resists the temptations of sin. In every season, in every stage of your life, you will have new temptations that you have to learn to conquer. Yes. And the only way to do it is to walk with the cross. To pick up the cross daily, Luke says it. Not when I was 15, 25. Abraham picked up the cross when he was 75. He carried it until he was 100 years old, <laughs> until he saw the promise fulfilled. And when I go to the cross, I'm reminded of all the benefits of his salvation that he paid for. Amen. Psalm 103 tells us that he forgives all of our iniquity. He heals all of our diseases. I'm carrying the cross until I see promises fulfilled. Amen. He wants to give you victory over yourself. 
but you've got to learn to deny the self. The tension of desire. You know, we live in the tension of what theologians call the now and the not yet. I want you to write that down. The tension of the now and the not yet. God, I know you're faithful. I know you got, got uh, promises and all, but Lord, you said it, but it hasn't come to pass. So much of our life is waiting in the tension of what God said shall come to pass, but hasn't. The bigger concept of our Christian walk is that idea of the now and the not yet. How do I live now, now while we wait for the kingdom to be consummated? I'm waiting for it now. Lord, you said healing and miracles, but I'm waiting for mine. I believe you now, but it hadn't happened yet. Somehow we get smarter and worse at the same time. But he came to save this world. When he said it was finished, when he hung upon the cross and spilled his blood for you and I and all who believe, he took the judgment of sin upon him in his death so that you and I could have eternal life. We who are being saved are a first fruits of creation which will be fully restored to its former glory as at the beginning in the garden, at the consummation of the kingdom. Now, Paul says, we have this treasure in earthen vessels. The Spirit of God has a down payment or a deposit on the glory that shall be revealed in us. St. Paul says that the sufferings of this present time shall not be compared with the glory that shall be revealed in us. We live in the tension of the now and the not yet. 2 Corinthians 4, 17, for our light affliction, which is but for a moment, is working for us a far more exceeding glory. You've been holding on doing the best that you know how. I'm resisting, Lord, and I'm living right. I'm waiting on you. And your present suffering is working in you a far more exceeding weight of glory. I want you to tell your neighbor that God is putting something weighty on you. There's a weight to the glory. There's a weight to the anointing. There's a connection between suffering and glory that you can't understand anointing and glory without going through something. And some of you have been laboring and suffering and enduring. And I'm telling you that God is producing something supernatural in your life so that as you walk into this new season, there are things that used to happen, they won't happen no more. There are things that would not happen, but they become normal. The things that used to be sporadic become commonplace. And he calls to us in this tension. This tense moment where Jesus is calling Peter out. I'm sure all the thoughts that are passing through Peter's mind when Jesus rebukes him and then just starts talking to everybody else. Get behind me, Satan. If y'all want to follow me, <laughs> you're going to have to go to the cross too. Amen. Can I fill in the gap? Y'all won't be like this. Get out of my way. We're going somewhere. This is not just for me. This is for all of us. The cross has the benefit of all of us. Y'all don't need me here. Y'all need me to do what God called me to do. Because as I step out and do what God has called me to do, it's making room for you to do what God is calling you to do. I mean, he's, I, I'm, I'm sitting there. I, I can put myself in Peter's shoes. I mean, can I just be honest? If y'all sit on the front row, y'all know y'all fair game. And you don't think that, like, oh, Lord, here you go. He's talking about me again. Come on, bitch. Come on, bishop. Don't say that. <laughs> think, think about what's going on. 
Here's what happens when he calls to us in the middle of this tense moment. He calls for us to wrestle for understanding with what God has said shall come to pass, but hasn't because the disciples wanted his kingdom to come in a way that was contrary to the cross. We want God to do it our way, not his way. He calls for us to discern our own callings. Hear me. You have to discern your calling. What does it mean? Gordon Smith in the book Courage and Calling speaks to three callings. There's a calling to follow Christ, a calling to a specific vocation, and to the simple everyday obedience, and that I need to discern what God is saying to me. That awareness of something deep within my spirit that yearns for and comes alive when the Word of God is preached. Discernment takes time in prayer, wrestling with Scripture, meditation, and awareness of the promptings of the Spirit. Discernment involves recognition of my gifts and abilities and confirmation by trusted godly voices. Why are you trying to figure out your life by yourself when God has called you to be a part of a body? His body. Your purpose does not exist in isolation. He calls us together to do great things for him. And I know you gifted, but are you faithful? I know you've been faithful in little things, but have you developed the gifts that God has given you? And are you and your mama the only ones telling you that you're good at something? <laughs> Sometimes it takes people who say, you know what, no, that's not it. And it hurts. Pick up the cross. <laughs> My last point, I want you to write this down. The cross causes tension. The cross causes tension. There's a reality that good leadership prepares you for challenge. Ah, I'm going to pause on that. I'm sorry. When we tell you, go jump off that high plateau and don't say, hey, that fall is going to be hard. That's foolish. There, there was a uh, a baptismal rite uh, in the early church in, in the first 300 years that developed that a bishop who was baptizing a convert, listen, y'all better thank God that y'all was born when y'all was born now. Don't go complaining, I wish I was born another time. That, that the bishop, after baptizing the, the convert and laying hands on him and praying for the fullness of, fullness of the Holy Spirit, that the bishop would give a little, slight little slap on the face and say, now go bear the, name, the, the shame of the gospel before this world and carry your cross because persecution is going to come. You say, well, I don't be preaching about persecution. No, no, no. He doesn't call us to a comfortable life. He calls us to a faithful life. He doesn't call us to a comfortable life. He calls us to a life of enduring and overcoming faith. And you have to be prepared that as I step into what God has for me, there might be tribulation. Jesus said, in this world, you're going to have tribulation, but be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. I want to tell you that in the middle of that tension, miracles happen. See, miracles don't happen in the life of the comfortable. Miracles don't happen in the life of those who don't step out, who don't say, God, you're saying a new thing. Let's step into it. Amen. Amen. The cross causes tension. Colossians 3, 5 through 11. Therefore, put to death what belongs to your earthly nature, sexual immorality, impurity, lust, evil desire, and greed, which is idolatry. Because of these things, God's wrath is coming upon the disobedient. And you once walked in these things when you were living in them. 
but now. Somebody say now. now. Put away all the following, anger, wrath, malice, slander, and filthy language. Yes, clean up your mouth from, yeah, filthy language from your mouth. Do not lie to one another since you have put off the old self with its practices and have put on the new self. Old self, new self, two selves. You are being renewed in knowledge according to the image of your creator. In Christ there is neither Greek nor Jew, circumcision and uncircumcision, barbarian, Scythian, slave, and free. But Christ is all in all. The life of the cross brings a stark difference between your old life and your new life. It's the tension of obedience. It's the daily, seasonal sacrifices and decisions to put God first even when it's difficult. We're going to be called in this year to do things that are difficult. And I remember even not long ago when Bishop said, do the difficult thing. It's picking up the cross. But when you do the difficult thing, when you do the new thing, you do the thing that's different, I'm not going to just sit comfortably and be like everybody else. Don't make me hurt your feelings. I'm not going to pick up that drink. But I'm going to say, you know what? I want to pr protect my witness. I'm not going to do what the old Chris would want to do. And when we live this type of life, it's the truest witness of the life of Christ. It's a life lived with an awareness of the direction of the Spirit. And so picking up our cross is a commitment to your ministry of prayer and service in your vocation and in the church it's demonstrating the love of God to others. It's not comfortable, but the comforter will empower you. It's not comfortable to pick up your cross and follow me, but we, wanna, we have to ask the question, where is Jesus? What's he up to? Where's he going? Are we going with him? Would you stand to your feet? Where is Jesus? What is he up to? Where is he going? Are we going with him? This morning, my assignment is to make you aware of the voice of the one who's calling you out of your place of comfort. He's calling you to believe again. You've got a gift of evangelism on the inside of you, and you haven't talked to anybody about Jesus in a long time. To believe again. In the face of fear, to trust. I know it gets scary, but he's faithful. He's faithful. Somebody needs to hear that this morning, that he's faithful. Amen. To pick up your cross daily and go where Jesus is going. That, that today when I get up out of the comforts of my own home and I'm walking to work, I'm going to work. If I have to walk to work in the season because I can't afford a vehicle, it's uncomfortable. But he's faithful. In your seasons of discomfort, listen to me, I'm telling you in your faithfulness, there's coming a season where it's not going to look like what it looked like right now. You got to know that if you're looking for a meal, but as you stay faithful to God and what he's told you to do, listen, there comes a season where that meal, you're going to have more than enough, but you got to be faithful. And I'm telling you today that if we'll believe again, You'll see God do miracles in your life. Yes. Yes. I want us to pray 
for a few groups of people this morning. There are times when in the body of Christ, some are making more sacrifices than others. And sometimes, whether it be sickness in the body or it be carrying an extra load of service because other people aren't doing their job, we we don't always know. Sometimes you are filling up within the body of Christ the sufferings of the Lord. And you said, and I want you to hear me, I want you to hear by the Spirit, that you say, Lord, when is this going to happen? When is this going to change? And you don't realize that what you're doing now, that light affliction, is preparing for a move of God. It's preparing for an outpouring of the Spirit. There are some times when God does it instantly, and there are some times where it takes a while, and we don't always know why. But as we're faithful in our difficulty, that God wants to break out something in this house. That when we come together, there's such a thickness of the glory of God, such a powerful move of the Spirit of God. When we come, that people walk from the outside and inside, instantly they're healed. I'm trying to reorient your thinking from natural life to spiritual life, supernatural life. That, when, that, that what God wants to do in this house, that there's such a, a, a sovereign move of God that when people walk in the house, I want you to understand that. People who touched the hem of Jesus' garments were healed. He didn't even pray for them. But there are people in this house that have been battling sickness. I want us to pray for them for a moment. There are some people who have been carrying barrenness in the womb. And you got to understand the grief there. This is a sacrifice. And, and there are some people that you don't know what they had to go through just to get to church this morning. We're going to pray for those people. Those are the sacrifices that God is pleased with. The broken and the contrite heart. I want you to grab the hand of the person next to you. Come on, I want you just to begin to pray for the person next to you. Pray for those in those categories that we just mentioned. Father, we thank you today for the outpouring of your spirit in this house.